from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. Newer corn hybrids may provide producers a much bigger window for applying a side dressing of nitrogen or other fertilizer. K-State Crop Nutrient Specialist Dorvar Ruiz-Diaz is here to discuss the options and the timing for side dressing applications. K-State Crop Entomologist Jeff Whitworth visits with Eric about corn rootworms, leaf beetles and soybeans, and alfalfa weevils. We'll also have the latest agricultural news, including this week's Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report, and K-State Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee continues his look at improving fishing opportunities in farm ponds by covering the management steps for improving the balance of fish species in a pond. It's all just ahead on Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. Well, there may be some parts of Kansas where soil moisture is getting dry enough to apply fertilizer, according to K-State Crop Nutrition Specialist Dorvar Ruiz-Diaz, and he has some thoughts. Dorvar, we have actually seen some drier days recently, and that gives us an opportunity to maybe talk about some of the soil conditions that we're seeing now. Yes. um, Again, with the drier weather, I think we have some conditions for uh, even some fertilizer application. In many cases, we did have a lot of wet conditions, obviously, this spring. And that generated the question of uh, have we lost some uh, nitrogen in many fields for corn in particular. So uh, I see many uh, producers are coming back with some citrus application for corn in particular. And in many cases, this is to complement a little bit uh, nitrogen that maybe was applied last fall or early spring. In some cases, we have, I think, some situations where uh, priority was to basically plant the corn and basically coming back with a fertilizer application after planting. So uh, I think that's a little bit the situation we have in in terms of some of the challenges that we have, again, with the wet soils in, in recent months. When it comes then to doing the side dressing application... What's the effectiveness of that? Is this kind of a, a risky proposition, I guess, is what I'm asking? Yes, it's a, it's a very good point. Uh, we've done a lot of work on in-season uh, nutrient management, uh, especially for mobile nutrients like nitrogen. And we have to think a little bit about here the different uh, type of nutrients and the value of that nutrient for in-season application. And again, if we're thinking about mobile nutrients like nitrogen, like sulfur, like chloride, typically we can manage those nutrients pretty easily in-season. We can basically do side dress, Again, the crop essentially will take advantage of that nutrient. Immobile nutrients is a little bit more challenge. We have to think about the timing and the placement of those uh, nutrients. Uh, We're talking about phosphorus, potassium, micronutrients. So essentially, we have a couple of different scenarios here for in-season fertilizer application. And again, coming back to the point of of, of side dressing, specifically for nitrogen, we have some uh, recent uh, studies uh, the last three years looking at timing of that uh, side dress application, including some very late application all the way to uh, tassel, basically, for corn. And the data we have shows that uh, essentially with the newer hybrids, new genetics for corn, that window for side dress is much bigger today. So essentially, we do have a lot more flexibility, and I think this is good news especially for those that maybe already have some nitrogen apply last fall or this spring, and maybe just thinking about complementing a little bit of nitrogen, uh, perhaps some situations where we maybe have a little bit of nitrogen losses or we are concerned about that, we can maybe come back with another 40 or 50 pounds at the most. And again, we're really talking about just complementing that nitrogen. And again, the, the results from more studies shows that even a VT, that corn still show response, especially if we are short of nitrogen. And again, with the situations we have, especially cases where we maybe have some nitrogen losses, in many cases, we probably won't see that deficiency until we really get very late in the season. And that corn basically run out of nitrogen, if you will, as uh, you're getting into that reproductive stage. Of course, if we have irrigation system that allows for split application of nitrogen pretty late in the season and, and 
I think there's no reason if we do have that possibility with the irrigation system, we should be thinking about that late application and in-season uh, management of nitrogen. And we do have some situations, like I say, I, I got some questions from uh, some producers that were not able to apply nitrogen and they are basically more focused, uh, of, of course, in planting the, in then coming back with nitrogen application. In that scenario, of course, we want to make a short and, and come back as soon as possible to make sure that corn is not suffering uh, any uh, stress, nitrogen stress early in the season. And again, that would be a, a different scenario. So again, thinking about those mobile nutrients, that's typically, we are talking about soil application, of course. These are nutrients that we need in high amounts. Typically, it needs to be applied to the soil. And this brings to the other um, alternative that we have for in-season management, which is perhaps maybe thinking about foliar application, um, which again, we've done some work on that as well. Foliar application, I think, provides some uh, uh, opportunities, especially for immobile nutrients and especially for nutrients that we need in very small amounts. And in this case, we're typically talking about micronutrients, things that can be applied low rates via foliar application. But again, we're thinking about the macronutrients. Most of our results shows that we really need to be thinking about soil application for those macronutrients that we need in high rates. Is there a risk that we could add too much nitrogen? Yes, that's an excellent point, um, and, and this is uh, actually a question that we've been getting, again, especially with the concern of nitrogen losses. And, and I think we have to be a little bit careful here because uh, we do have some situations where we maybe already apply the full rate of nitrogen either last fall or this spring, and because of the concern of um, nitrogen losses may be coming back with very high rates. And, and so in that case, we're talking about maybe an excessive rates, especially if we haven't lost that much nitrogen, if we are overestimating how much nitrogen perhaps we, we lost in, in many of our fields. And, and that's a very good point. And, and of course, there are some uh, clear uh, issues related to that. We have clearly the environmental side of things in terms of excessive nutrient application, uh, but of course, also the economics. Uh, we don't want to put any nutrients that we don't need. With tight budgets um, uh, lately, of course, we want to make sure and we're putting that fertilizer where it's needed, especially for, for nitrogen. So there are some alternatives there. I think we have to think about perhaps monitoring that crop a little bit closer rather than being too quick, perhaps, and putting uh, additional nitrogen. I know some producers who are establishing, for example, reference strips, basically areas of the field where they are putting additional nitrogen and basically monitoring that area and compare that to the rest of the field and see how they compare and whether or not we are seeing a difference in terms of uh, uh, greenness and, and response of that corn, indicating essentially if we are uh, deficient of in nitrogen or not. So again, there are some alternatives there. Soil sampling is not necessarily a very uh, useful tool in season for nitrogen, and this is something we need to emphasize because we do use in Kansas, we do recommend profile nitrogen for pre-plan uh, to evaluate residual nitrogen, but in season, there are many things happening on the daily basis in terms of the nitrogen cycle, and that means some uh, nitrification, some mineralization, nitrification, basically fertilizer that was applied maybe as an anhydrous or as a urea, converting from ammonium to nitrate, and then mineralization, basically organic matter with the higher temperatures going to start to release nitrogen. So there's a lot of variability in season, and it's very difficult to get a, a good estimate of, of what the actual level in the soil by using in-season soil tests. So we have to be a little bit careful. I know some producers who still use this tool um, uh, essentially to have a an estimate, and I think it's, it, that's a good good approach, but we also have to be careful not to rely too much on that number because of the challenges we see in terms of nitrogen in season. Do we have any idea of how the rain does affect nitrogen loss? Is there a way for them to know based on how much rainfall they possibly received whether there could be a problem? That's an excellent point, and I think there are a few things that we have to keep in mind. Uh, remember, most of the nitrogen uh, uh, process in the soil is basically driven by microbial activity. So that basically brings in, in the equation uh, a couple of key points, and, and one is the presence of oxygen in the soil, as well as soil temperature. One thing that's been, um, I think, a little bit uh, an advantage, maybe a positive thing in recent months, is that we've been uh, uh, fairly low in soil temperature. And I think, in my opinion, that's been helping a little bit to slow down that microbial activity that, again, uh, is necessary for that nitrogen to become uh, nitrate, which is essentially what we're going to be losing either as a leaching or denitrification. So essentially, we need to have conditions for that nitrogen to 
transform to nitrate, and then we need to have conditions as well for uh, nitrogen losses. That means soils that are a little bit more sandy, more coarse textured soils, they're going to have a little bit higher risk of losing nitrogen. Fields that we have water standing there for a long time, especially as we're getting later in June and getting in July, that tends to be a little bit of a problem. I will say in the last few months with the water standing in the fields, was probably still not a big concern because, again, with the low soil temperature, that microbial activity is still very low. But that combination of high microbial activity and a lot of water, especially in some soils, that usually is going to be the the combination that tends to drive these uh, potential nitrogen losses. So essentially, um, every every field is going to be different. I think the producers will have to evaluate every situation. In addition to these factors, of course, we have to be thinking about what source of nitrogen the producer used in this particular case. What was the timing of that nitrogen application? Some fertilizer sources like anhydrous ammonia tends to be more stable. We have other sources like uh, urea and UAN that maybe will convert to nitrate a little bit faster. So again, all of those are uh, factors that will be playing in, in this decision. So again, um, many producers who did anhydrous application in the spring, I think in most cases probably still pretty safe at this point. Now if we are thinking about what happened uh, um, in the next few weeks, late June, um, early July, as we have higher soil temperature, and if we continue to have wet conditions, I think at that point, obviously, the risk of nitrogen losses will go up significantly. And what is kind of the drop-dead window here for making that late application? Yes, um, the, the studies that we have, uh, we evaluated up to uh, tassel uh, in corn. Uh, so, um, and, and, and we are seeing that up to that point, uh, we do see um, very good response to nitrogen application, especially if we are short of nitrogen in some fields. One thing that we have to keep in mind is that, uh, of course, a key factor here for that late application to make it work is that we need to have rain to move that nitrogen in the root zone. And that could be a challenge in some of our uh, dryland systems. Of course, we've been having a very wet season, so maybe that will, won't be an issue this year. But that's something that we need to keep in mind. For Again, for producers who have the capability of putting uh, water through irrigation system, uh, this is not a concern. Again, I think if we are talking about most of the eastern part of the state. Also, we typically will have that rainfall to incorporate the nitrogen. But if we go in dry land, central and western Kansas, that's a little bit more questionable. And that's a situation that I think we still need to be thinking about trying to have that nitrogen rather early and not wait too much in that kind of scenario. That's K-State Crop Nutrition Specialist Dorvar Ruiz Diaz with thoughts on fertilizer application for corn. Agriculture Today is back in a moment. This is the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test, fix, save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're tuned to the K-State Radio Network. As you might imagine... Moving now into the middle part of June, insect activity in our field crops is starting to ramp up. And that's exactly what we'll hear now from our guest. He is a crop insect specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Jeff Whitworth. We'll talk about, among other things, corn rootworms, leaf beetles and soybeans, the efficacy of seed treatments on those latter two crops. But we'll start, Jeff, with a brief overview of what's going on in alfalfa. And not surprisingly, weevils are among those insects which are readily present out there, you say. Yes. uh, Thank you for having me. Uh, We've been talking about alfalfa, it seems like, for couple of months, you know, in fact, we have. Um, The alfalfa weevil this year doesn't seem to want to go away. Uh, We started having problems with uh, significant alfalfa weevil populations back in early April, and some of the growers started putting out insecticide treatments to help cure the problem with the alfalfa weevil back in early April. And 
today we're still having some problems, although they're really, really going away. So that's what I thought we ought to talk about. I've gotten a couple of calls this week about spraying alfalfa for alfalfa weevil adults. The alfalfa weevil is a cool weather insect that comes every year maybe from late February to mid-April. This year it was early April when we started getting the populations. You know, growers started spraying for alfalfa weevils once or twice. did a pretty good job. I've seen some really nice fields of alfalfa that had good treatments applied in a timely fashion, did really well, and now they're reaping the reward when they can. Because of the cool, wet weather, they haven't been able to get out there. But some of the fields that weren't treated in as timely a manner, are still having problems with alfalfa weevils. And one of the problems is, as I said, it's a cool weather insect. We've had relatively cool weather. And by that, I mean, you know, once it gets up to 85 to 90 degrees, the alfalfa weevil adults will leave the fields. Or once that first cutting has gone down, the alfalfa weevil will leave the field because usually that allows the sun to get down and penetrate to where they are in the, in the residue uh, on the ground. But this year that hasn't happened, so what we're seeing are a lot of these fields, a lot of alfalfa weevil adults hanging around the fields, and they will feed a little bit. They're not near as voracious as the larvae, but they will feed a little bit on the stems, and they'll eat on the epidermis or the outside of the stem. They do what they call barking, and I've gotten several pictures from extension agents this year about the showing the barking on the stems, wondering if that's going to actually hurt the alfalfa. No, I, I, I say no, it doesn't. It hasn't under good growing conditions. But if the alfalfa weevil adults don't go away and, and they actually swat the alfalfa and then they put it in wren rows, what you're doing, even if you sprayed, you're accumulating all of the weevils in the field right underneath the windrow. And that's providing shade. So even if it's hot, until you pick up that windrow alfalfa, the the weevils are going to be there, and they will feed a little bit on those stems, and they will nip them off and bark them. And so when you finally go by and do pick up the windrow, you'll see that characteristic striping in the field. Now, there's some you know shading and some other things that add to that, but if you go out and look, a lot of those stems – are what we call bark. They have the characteristic uh, symptoms of the adult weevils where they fed on it. That normally doesn't hurt the alfalfa. It might set it back a little bit. That's why it's a little smaller, a little shorter than the areas right beside the windrows. But it normally comes right back. But it doesn't do any good to spray. You, you, the, the adults, as soon as you, you pick that hay up, they're going to leave. They're not going to feed on the hay that you put in the, in the, in the bale or put in the shed. They're just going to leave. They're going to go away. We're not exactly sure where they go. Some place to hang out for the summer in the, in the shade along creeks or, you know, some place. We've tried to figure that out and have not had the best success of figuring out where they go. But they don't stay out in the alfalfa field and feed, but they will come back in the fall. You know, even if you have a good 99% control of the alfalfa weevils in your field this year and you think, well, maybe that will help for next year. It doesn't. Right. It hasn't seemed to help. I don't, we've tried spraying in the in the winter and burning and all this kind of stuff, and so far we haven't had any consistent control other than spraying when needed in the spring. So the bottom line is there are still some pupae out there, especially in the northern part of the state, and lots of adults don't spray. It's not gonna. It's not gonna do any good. It's not gonna lessen the damage, and it's just gonna. You know, take the, the insecticide and put it out there where the beneficials or non-target organisms can get into it, and it's just a waste of money right yeah. now. Keep your cash in your pocket. Don't worry about alfalfa weevil control at this juncture. But there are other pests at work out there in alfalfa stands. P. aphids, potato leaf hoppers, you say, as well. What about responding to those, Jeff? Exactly. P. aphids, again, are a cool-weather insect. We generally have problems with those before the first cutting. Or in the fall, you know, when you plant new alfalfa in the fall, sometimes we get P. aphid populations that are justified to be treated, okay? This, right now, we've had relatively cool, cloudy weather. We still have healthy populations of P. aphids, at least in central Kansas. So if you've been lucky enough to get your field cut and get the the hay picked up, keep your eye on that stubble because the aphids are still coming in. They're still migrating in. And they're still there. And it doesn't take an aphid population very long to build up because, if you remember, they reproduce parthenogenically, which means they don't have to 
look for a mate. They don't have to wait. The, the eggs hatch. There are females. They just produce females. Those females produce females. So those populations could explode pretty quickly, especially in those fields that were sprayed for alfalfa weevils because you've probably taken care of most of the beneficial populations. Uh, lady beetles and green lace wings and there are several little parasitic wasps that will really do a number on aphids. P. aphids also is no exception. But if there aren't any in the field, that's going to allow the P. aphids to build up. So you need to get out and watch. Now, once, it, and I, I saw the forecast for the next week, it's supposed to be relatively cool. I mean, if that's the case, it's going to allow the P. aphids to stay around. So it may, they suck the juice out of the plant. They may actually um, retard the regrowth of those fields. And if they haven't been cut yet, it still may slow down uh, the plants that are waiting to be cut. Also, potato leaf hoppers. The difference between potato leaf hoppers and pea aphids, pea aphids are cool weather insects. Potato leaf hoppers are generally warm weather insects. They normally come in between the you know, first and second or second and third cutting, but they're here. They've been coming in uh, in, large, in fairly large numbers for the last two or three weeks. The problem with potato leaf hoppers, again, all the ones we've seen this in the past week are adults, which means they're still migrating in, but I'm sure they're laying eggs. They're inserting eggs in the stems. Again, they've sucked the juice out of the plant, so they're going to be competing with the plants. If there is a moisture problem, which right now it's over, uh, the problem is there's too much moisture, but mm -hmm. if there is, they will be competing with that. But they can also transmit some some toxins to the plant that cause what, what we call hopper burn, a yellowing of the leaves. It can actually kill the leaves if you've got too many of them. It can actually kill the stem and kill out the plant. Normally, it's not that big a problem if you've got a full canopy there. You swath it, and that takes care of them. But right now, what we're finding in a lot of fields that have just recently been cut, the potato leaf hoppers are there. So they're going to be feeding. They're going to be, you know, transmitting the toxin. It's going to be retarding the growth of the plants also, along with the P. aphids. So just be aware that they're out there. They're migrating in like crazy right now. The nice thing about it, if you do decide you have to have an insecticide application, they're really effective at controlling both pests. Treatment threshold is very low, so it doesn't take very many to trigger a treatment. Now, I say it will control them. It does control them, and in years past, I've never seen them reinfest a field. But that's normally when they come in between the second and the third cutting. This, this is, is a this, different this, animal Right, this, this is early. So what I say, if you do treat or if you decide to let it go and go ahead and harvest and swath it and get it out, just keep checking for the next 10 or 14 days afterwards and then weekly after that to make sure the population doesn't build up. So uh, it's kind of a strange year this year weather-wise. I just stay strange. It's Kansas, right? But <laughs> still, you, you got to get out and watch this alfalfa. And it's a, an important thing to get on top of, although the season has been odd with the late growth and the wet weather and so forth. But weevils, not to worry about them. Pea aphids, potato leaf hoppers maybe deserve a little more attention on your part. Appreciate your time and the update. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. Crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth of K-State Research and Extension has been our guest on this part of agriculture today. Thanks, Eric. And there's more. Eric has additional information coming up later this morning from Jeff in our new segment as they discuss the finding of the first larva of the corn rootworm in the nursery last week and what that may mean for producers. And don't forget to listen to the podcast version of Agriculture Today. Visit agtoday.net, agtoday.net, or using an app on your mobile device, type these search keywords, agriculture. Today, Kansas, and you'll find this program. By tapping the subscribe button, brand new episodes of Agriculture Today will automatically arrive on your device. That's agtoday.net. This is the K-State Radio Network. Burgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. 
eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. In today's agricultural news, taking a look at the Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report for the week ending June 9th, according to the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service, topsoil and moisture supplies rated 0% very short, 2% short, 74% adequate, and 24% surplus. Subsoil and moisture, 0% very short, 1% short, 73% adequate, and 26% surplus. Winter wheat condition rated 3% very poor, 9% poor, 30% fair, 46% good, and 12% excellent. Winter wheat coloring, 49%, well behind 75% last year, and 74 for the five-year average. Mature was 2%, well behind the 25% last year. Corn condition rated 3% very poor, 11% poor, 39% fair, 42% good, and 5% excellent. Corn planted was 89%, behind 98% last year and the 97% average. Emerged was 73%, well behind 95% last year and the 90% average. Soybeans planted was 48%, well behind 88% last year and the 69% average. Emerged was 24%, well behind 73% last year and the 50% average. Sorghum planted was 25%, again well behind 64% last year and the 50% average. Cotton condition rated 13% very poor, 15% poor, 40% fair, 31% good, and 1% excellent. Cotton planted was 76%, behind 89% last year, but near the 72% average. Sunflowers planted was 38%, behind 51% last year, but near the 37% average. Pasture and range conditions rated 1% very poor, 3% poor, 23% fair, 56% good, and 17% excellent. Now Eric has more with K-State entomologist Jeff Whitworth. K-State has a corn rootworm nursery to test insecticides, and Jeff tells Eric they found the first larva last week. Which means the first ones that have hatched out. This is probably two weeks later than normal, and I was actually surprised that we found any because of the moisture problem we've had. Part of our nursery's been underwater, or water has washed down through there, but they are just now hatching out, apparently, at least in central Kansas. Now, the thing is, corn rootworm eggs and corn rootworm larvae float. So just because you've had water in your fields or water running through your fields doesn't mean it killed all of the corn rootworms. It probably means it moved them. So if you have some place where the water, you know, piled up or if you see some debris in your field with some plants still growing, you could have a real corn rootworm infestation in that area. Now, I realize most folks don't have corn rootworm problems anymore uh, because we've learned to manage them by crop rotation after two years or one year, or we use a BT corn rootworm variety of corn, which still is pretty good, although every year we're finding a few more resistant fields. But we're just now having rootworms hatch, so they're probably two weeks behind. I always used to recommend if you don't have lodged corn by the 4th of July, you're probably out of the corn rootworm vulnerable time of the year, okay? So just heads up, corn rootworms are just now hatching. So if you're thinking about a lay-by treatment, or an inferral treatment or something like that, you got about two more weeks before you probably start noticing the corn laying over. Seed treatments, I get a lot of questions about those. Seed treatments, as, as far as insecticides, will last three to four weeks, 21 to 28 days, mm -hmm. from the time it's planted until the time when the insecticide is dissipated for the most part. We planted, and a lot of other people planted in mid-April, if the corn is just now starting to germinate a little bit, it's starting to look good, which is the case with our plots, seed insecticide is not going to be viable. It's not going to help it's you. It's spent. Then. It is. But if you, have to, if you have to go back and replant your new variety, because all the corn has an insecticide seed treatment, it will help protect it for two to three weeks. Uh, also, soybeans, uh, I've gotten a lot of calls about that because right now, if you plant soybeans, you know, this is more like double crop soybeans coming in after wheat or maybe even in the next week or two because a lot of the soil is still awful wet. Seed treatments will help, again, 21 to 28 days. In wet soils, 
if it's really wet and the soil has held water, that will suffocate the insects for the most part, the soil insects. We've looked in many places. We've dug, you know, soil and looked, and we're not finding near as many wireworms or white grubs as we normally do in the soil, and I'm attributing that to just drowning, or they've moved. So that's a consideration. But seed treatments, they work really well. But we in Kansas, we really just don't need them unless you know that you're planting into a high-risk area. Then it's probably worth it. But otherwise, in Kansas at least, over the last 25 years, we've tested them. They work really well. But we just, from a practical standpoint, we just don't need them. Well, June is National Dairy Month, and this week's Milk Lines, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook encourages dairy operators to use it as an opportunity to show and to explain to visitors the steps they take to promote animal welfare. June is Dairy Month, and we'll probably have some visitors on many of our farms. So what are you going to show them as they come to your farm? One of the things I guess I would encourage you to think about to include in your program as you deal with visitors coming onto your farm is how do you handle animals on your farm and what do you do to promote animal welfare? Think about what they're actually going to see as they walk around your dairy. More importantly, what are they going to perceive about how you handle animals and how you care for animals as they walk around your dairy? How does this reflect upon your dairy and how does it reflect upon the dairy industry at large? As people view our dairies and as they think about what we do and as they think about what they are actually seeing, what do we do to help them understand what they're seeing? You know, we've had a lot of great advances in cow comfort and reducing cow stress and heat abatement on our dairy farms. It's just truly amazing to me how far we've actually come in the last 20 years as to how we actually care for animals. But how have we actually communicated that to those that are maybe visiting our dairy for the first time or maybe seeing a dairy farm for the very first time? So what I want to encourage you as you have visitors on your farm, whether it is during June, which is dairy month, or other times of the year, make sure you talk about how you care for your animals and make sure you highlight the fact that in most cases our dairy farms have all been through some sort of animal welfare, animal handling certification. Many of our dairies have very extensive training processes that they put new employees through so they understand how to properly care for animals and how to properly handle animals. Make sure you highlight those things as you visit with folks about your dairy operation. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to speak out on what they're doing to promote animal care and animal health training on their farms. Thanks, Mike. And that's a look at today's agricultural news. This is the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This Agriculture Today closes out on another aspect of wildlife management. Mike side once again, Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee of K-State Research and Extension. As we continue on on this topic of improving fishing opportunities in farm ponds, Charlie, last week you passed along the guidelines for taking inventory of what fish one has in one's pond. Now we'll move on to actually taking management steps to improve what you call the balance of fish species in a pond in regard to harvest management of the pond, right? Yes, improper harvest of fish ruins future fishing probably more than most other causes. I think one of the biggest mistakes many pond owners make is that they don't harvest enough bass and bluegill out of a pond. That typically leads to overcrowding and slow growth of of the bass. Many people like to focus on largemouth bass, and there are a few folks that like to focus on bluegill. And management 
options really vary depending upon the goal of the farm pond owner. Wildlife and Parks has, has broken those options down into three or four different primary ones. The first option would be the all-purpose option. Um, that's where you would try to have the opportunity to catch a variety of species of fish with a variety of sizes. Then there would be a pan fish option where you were, your primary goal would be to harvest larger sized bluegill. And then the big bass option where your goal or primary opportunity is to catch a trophy sized bass. Let's take each of those up individually. The all purpose option, when we're talking about management here, what does that entail? Well, the first thing is to delay fishing uh, initially. Uh, we don't want to harvest any bass from ponds at least until year three. It doesn't mean you can't fish, but you should release those fish back into the pond get them to allow them to grow to an adequate size. Bass will have probably spawned three times during a four-year period after fingerlings were stocked, and then the young bass that are produced can start to exist in a kind of surplus numbers. Once we've switched over to trying to follow through on our all-purpose option, we want to catch bass over 15 inches long with, uh, with any type of consistency. You've got to have numbers of 8 to 12 inch bass that's got to be reduced. In a pond uh, that's got average fertility, about 38 to 12 inch bass should be harvested per acre after the fourth year from stocking. If you've got a high fertility pond, and many of our Kansas ponds are high fertility, you could take as many as 50 small bass per acre per year. This removal of these small bass reduces the competition and it makes it possible for some fish to get larger than 15 inches in length. You want to make sure that at least 10 percent of the catchable size bass that survive to lengths of 15 inches and longer and all of the 12 to 15 inch bass that are caught to be released. It's kind of key for that 12 to 15 inch size bass. You can harvest bluegill as desired. You're probably not going to over harvest those. But most ponds, we worry about harvest management. And to do something about that, we need to target the largemouth bass, the predator in that pond. So that's the formula if you wish to have a prolonged harvest of both the panfish and bass, but the panfish option itself, how does one amend their harvesting to promote that? Well, this panfish option is really suited for young kids. Most youngsters don't really care what species of fish they catch. They just like to catch fish in high numbers. So if catching big panfish is more important than harvesting bass and catching big bass, continue to release all 15-inch bass past that initial two, three, and four year period after stocking. And then bass over that 15 inches can be harvested, but there's going to be very few of those bass that are going to grow to that size if you maintain that 15 inch uh, length limit. So you want those high densities of the eight to 15 inch bass. They're more effective in controlling bluegills and other panfish than moderate numbers of bass of several different sizes. When you follow this type of a harvest management scheme, you're going to produce more 8-inch uh, and longer bluegills. That really uh, works well as long as you have at least 18 inches of water visibility. Following that panfish option, you're going to produce some trophy-sized bluegill, something that's really going to put a smile on kids' faces when they catch those larger bluegill. Now... For those who want to go the big bass route, does one more or less flip the panfish approach upside down to promote the harvest of large bass? Well, not necessarily. You, again, you, you're going to release all bass that are under 15 inches for a, a period of, of four years after you've stocked. And no bass over 15 inches should be harvested during that time period. After that, the densities of 8 to 15-inch bass should be reduced even more than what they would have been in the all-purpose option where we were talking about removing 30 on low-fertility ponds and 50 on high-fertility ponds. 
in this scheme, uh, with a pond of average fertility, you should harvest 30 to 50, 8 to 12 inch bass per acre per year, as well as at least 5, 12 to 15 inch bass per acre per year. Bass that are greater than 15 inches in length should continue to be released unless you catch a trophy. So those would be kind of the options that uh, there are for people that are willing to develop and implement a harvest management plan. What I see as a very common problem is that, particularly for the those that are interested in trophy bass, is they catch and release all of the bass in the pond. We need to harvest some small bass to allow more food for the faster growth of the intermediate-sized bass. So... There is some thought that goes to managing a farm pond. It's not difficult, but it starts with coming up with a plan, following through on that management plan. That includes uh, pond construction, development, stocking, harvest management, and then you're going to be satisfied with that pond for years to come. Well, those are the recommended tactics for managing farm pond fish to whatever objective that you have for your fishing out of that pond. And Charlie, we appreciate the overview. Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Our time's away for today. Thanks for listening. And for Jeff Wickman, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.